uh, for coming for that very important and special breakfast. And uh, I can now remember Alice. Alice was there. Alice was there. So Alice, what I want to encourage you, attend the class. There is a. Uh, the, have you seen a Google uh, class coming on? There's a, a class that will come on through Google. Let me just share, ask the instructor to share the link with you so that you can catch up again from earlier. There is a different class because that class will help you to proceed on continuously every day of this week so that you can proceed out with, with them so that you can proceed out with them every day of this, uh, of this week. Let me just see. Let me just see. So I'm trying to link this class up. Now, so Alice, you might need to, let me allow just a minute to let me reach the instructor. Let me reach the instructor a bit. Just give me a minute. Sorry about that. The teacher will be ready. And uh, when the link comes, we'll be sharing. So tonight, yesterday we saw uh, a couple of things and sorry about that. Now, uh, okay, let me to the screen and uh, just share the notes. Uh, right, so we saw yesterday the organization involved the, the organization involved in humanitarian diplomacy right here uh, is a bit slow but uh, will be there will be right there will be right there right do you see the screen class Please unmute and let me know if you can see. Yes. We, do you see the screen? Yes, we can. Yeah, right. We can. saw the aims of humanitarian diplomacy, objectives of humanitarian, of, an, of uh, what objectives will effective humanitarian diplomacy achieve. We saw historic examples on temporary development. And then yesterday, um, we saw the Order of Malta is an interesting example. It maintains bilateral diplomatic relations with more than 100 countries and has observer status with the United Nations and other international organizations, which allow it to conduct humanitarian diplomacy on a bilateral and bilateral level. Let's look at the legal context. It's very important to understand 
the legal context of humanitarian diplomacy. And here we go. Legally speaking, humanitarian diplomacy takes place in two main cases. Somebody can read for us. Priscilla, do you want to read for us? Do you have a big screen you can see properly? Yes. Go ahead. I'm actually Help us. Okay. Uh, legally speaking, right. should I start from there? You're fine. Yes. Legally speaking, humanitarian diplomacy can take two place in main in in two main cases. One nat natural disasters right. in time of in time in time of peace, domestic law and human human rights law are applicable. The International Federation of the Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies, mm -hmm. that is uh, IFRC, has mm -hmm. over the past years been developing, a, developing an international disaster response law, rules and principal programs. Thank ID you. Thank you. IDRLA is called International Disaster Response Laws, Rules and Principal, Principles Program. Uh, and then the other one is armed conflict, but allow me to deal with um, the legal context. Legally speaking, you maintain diplomacy take place in two main cases. So one is the natural one. And allow me to, uh, to come on what you call international disaster response uh, laws, rules, and principles program. It's good for the people in the humanitarian sector to have policies in place and laws that enable a, a, a quick emergency response or that makes humanitarian response flexible. For example, there is an earthquake, a hurricane, uh, business has been carried away or broken down, floods, droughts. Um, we have seen locusts. You know that, do you remember time when there was locusts in Russia and then part of Europe and Africa? And people say that was not a good sign. But as much as we knew it was not a good sign, it was a sign of the pandemic and maybe war, maybe spiritually, but again, how are we prepared? Uh, that's a very great question everybody needs to ask themselves. How are we prepared in any area about any emergency or in the context of humanitarian diplomacy? Uh, we prepare education, we prepare with, with our mindset, psychological preparation financially, setting times aside and many things, putting effort and sacrifice into it for an effort. But in the humanitarian context, we have few organizations are doing such a high level humanitarian response or a few countries that are able to probably do such a big response like the United States. Because for example, there's a collapsing of a a building, uh, there is a um, sinking of a, of a ship, a huge ship, for example, a ship or the refugee crossing from Ethiopia to Europe. Uh, what are the, some of the responses? Or maybe hunger across the world, maybe sickness like Ebola, malaria, name them. Uh, Nowadays, there is something that is, that is called uh, education in emergencies. And I believe there is also a humanitarian need because during the pandemic, many physical schools were closed down. How do we really create a response and an emergency response towards that? And I want to let the class know that it's not the work just for government. Government cannot do without civilians 
uh, who are not even about, aware about it. So one of the things is capacity building, equipping right people, the right knowledge at the right time in the right way, getting the right equipment and the right services. You know what I'm saying? Uh, it's critically very important that we are equipped and then we are ready for humanitarian response um, and other, uh, other emergencies. So in the humanitarian sector, the International Federation of the Red Cross and Red Christian Societies, um, IFRC. It says over the past years have been developing international disaster response laws, rules, and principal programs. Let me tell you, it's a lot of work and encompass someone because you have to tell people the United Nations or in Geneva Convention, who are you, what do you like to do, and what will be the kind of the response you are going to carry out, and then you, you need a, uh, a funding for the same. Uh, not just funding, funding can be there, but how do you break through in a country? How do you enter people's country or another country and even carry out your services as a humanitarian organization? As you saw in Geneva edition of Protocol 1 and Protocol 2 of 1977, a, human a humanitarian chaplain can do that. A humanitarian negotiator can do that according to the international humanitarian law. If you get to learn and understand what the international humanitarian law is, the international customary humanitarian law is, and other laws concerned about military and the humanitarian services, you should be able to understand that there is a need, general, uh, big scoop understanding the international disaster response. And every country, it's good that they put the humanitarian policy in place that understands the vulnerability uh, people are vulnerable, that, that these principles, these uh, laws and rules are forecast the humanitarian need. And we'll do that, institutions will do that. Yourself, you, I want you to imagine the, um, the, uh, the challenges one faces or an organization when they want to deliver food, especially maybe in Africa and in South America, and maybe some parts of Europe, I'm not aware. Uh, I want just to see the challenges that um, an organization is, is facing to deliver medicine, maybe build schools, uh, maybe educate children, so the question is, what can we really do uh, to make the people understand that we are not just coming in their country, we are also here to bring them a sustainable humanitarian response program. So there is many things that surrounds humanitarian response, things that surrounds emergency preparedness, uh, psychologically, organizations should be prepared. Do you have teachers to help people? Do you have resources? That, that is uh, tools. So the first thing is the preparatory stage. And in the preparatory stage, uh, the people you're approaching, the country, the people in need, are they sure that do they feel they done need? They might be feeling it, but they miss the understanding. That's, the, 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 the country, the government, or that type of a nation understands how we respond to the, the need of this kind of a response. And here comes also political challenges, customary challenges, military challenges, social or economic challenges at the same time. So when we talk about international disaster or response, laws, rules, and principle program is a scoop of a huge, it's like officers uh, or military personnel prepared to handle emergencies around the world. You see that? You're normally on a standby, guarding 24 seven. We as humanitarians, what is that that qualify you to be a humanitarian diplomat where you are creating uh, negotiation? 
Because are we really, are we really, are we really humanitarians? Are we really equipped to be able to do an emergency response if people are abducted? Do we have negotiators ready? For example, if people are being trafficked, uh, if a flood strikes and the population of the people are vulnerable, in the in case of uh, of conflict, political conflicts, uh, are they are we really ready? So the international disaster response law is is very critical because according to the Geneva Convention, this is one of the important one of the important things that we ought to know and even understand. So armed conflicts, number two is armed conflict during, uh, just maybe before we, we go on, I just want us to look for this and see if our students uh, will get some benefit from this kind. Allow me to just jump on it and try to pull it on the screen so that I may bring it to the class. Let me see if I can bring this to the students. Let me try to pull it out. Yeah. Please mute yourself. Give me a little minute. Just uh, let me see if I can bring it to the, yeah, right. International, it's called international, it says a response. Uh, let me try to pull it out for the class. And then we'll take a bit of time to look at it so that you can understand what it is and what it entails uh, for us to really do this. It's very interesting. Let me bring it from the libraries I like of the Google. Um, uh, let me just uh, bring it to class. Um, mm, let me bring it, it's just opening, it's just opening. Just opening. I think my computer is slow tonight, but let it all just open. Opening a bit slowly, but fine. Let me share this screen with us. Mm. So the international disaster response rules and all that. Um, uh, let me just share this on the screen. Now this is it. Uh, the this is from the International Federation of Red Cross. This is what it says. This is for the 2006. Uh, I stands for international. That's the concern for foreign and international actors. All actors in the humanitarian sector did assess a natural man made but not armed conflict. Our response preparedness, re re relief, re reliability, rehabilitation, rehabilitation, sorry, reconstruction. And then L is uh, laws, rules, principles. So, what is I, why BOVA International Disaster Response Law? It's about the legal problem that cons, uh, consistently arises in international uh, disaster operation. So, without this, there's delay needed. A. Create needless, they are saying, create needless costs, reduce efficiency, uh, uh, af affect quality. Reduce confidence in humanitarian 
uh, action. So it is all speaking about how easy is it we can do a humanitarian response with ease. In fact, if you look at the screen properly, there is a couple of us. Uh, you can go through letter, try to pull down some of us because it says, this is what it says, especially down here. Focus exemption and entitled address, addressing visas, customs and legal uh, personality, taxes, cost, security, comparable to what is granted. Now, the international disaster uh, response, rules, regulation principles, is concerned about exempt of some things that are needed in the humanitarian sector to be able to meet the need of the vulnerable people. Exemption of uh, like some visas, custom issues you want to bring in maybe a thousand containers of medicine or a tent for the, for the people affected, maybe the refugees, men or women. And then the legal personality, taxes, security issues, you see that? So here is you're asking for, you're asking for, um, you know, that this will be taken away so that you as an organization, you can properly respond to the, and quickly to the humanitarian need of that particular place, that particular region, in that particular country, you see that. So it's very, some of you, even you had containers of um, goods of assistance. Maybe you have the orphans, or you want to build schools or hospitals. This has no much to do with your, with your profit. When you realize that the government is saying you need to pay taxes for this, and because you're not ready, it keeps lying at the port for a very long time. In the end of the day, you quickly realize that, oh, oh, we have made a lot of losses. We needed to meet a particular need, but we are not able. So point number B is armed conflict. So legally speaking, one is natural disaster, another armed conflict. Uh, during this response, during international conflicts, international, Humanitarian law bestows upon the ICRC the right to access victims, in particular to civilians, the Fourth Geneva Convention and prisoners of war, the Third Geneva Convention, according to Common Article 3, during non international armed conflicts, humanitarian actors can only offer their services. You see that, not war. Now, class, you need to understand what is the uh, but what is the fourth Geneva Convention? Just uh, allow me to open out that uh, for the class so that we are able to understand all of us. Let me say, go on the screen, Google with you so that when you're doing your research, you'll have more time. So we are saying fourth Geneva Convention, Geneva Convention, Bob Geneva Convention. Let me give it PDF, Bob Geneva Convention. Let it just come up. And I think another one I shared the other day. So this is the Bob Geneva Convention on the website of the United Nations. Is something open and everybody can see this. It is opening on the UN website. Let's give it a little of time. Now, you can see the form Geneva Convention relative to the protection of civilian person in time of war of August 12th. 
12 August 1949. You see there is all these definitions, provisions, general protection population uh, against certain consequences. The whole of that is there, take time to read. Treatment of protected areas. You, if you have to do humanitarian work, you must be aware with the international humanitarian law comprehensive, must be aware with the requirements of that particular, you can see even religious duties here. Article 93 of the fourth Geneva Convention. By the way, you see religious leaders, let's see page 200. If you are a religious leader here, page number 200. I, I don't think it is captured here, but you can go to the other article I shared the book about, you should be able to get it. You should be able to get it and then utilize it. Uh, another point and allow me to share the screen on the same. If you need also, you can Google the, out the bad Geneva Convention. And then according to common article, so that you can understand the international, uh, the legal context of international humanitarian law. I want you to imagine walking around with signposts. So the international humanitarian law is a guidance of the signposts that guides us in what we should do when and how, especially in humanitarian diplomacy. And you are looking forward of raising humanitarian diplomats, equipping them this kind of means, but they have to understand what the international humanitarian law through research and study. So allow me to read this. But again, it says humanitarian actors should offer their services, not going under lockdown. No, it is their time. Humanitarian diplomacy negotiators will need to clarify which legal instruments are applicable in each given situation. Additionally, there's a need to analyze which mechanism will be able to declare applicable law. So what we're looking to, I'll read down here, as well as identify which implementing mechanism are operational on the ground. The following checklist would be useful. This is it, types of conflict. Is this an international armed conflict or an international armed conflict? Or an or combination of both? Are there different phases in the conflict? So this is the work of humanitarian diplomacy. Number two, parties to the conflict. Are there more than one party? Are there one or more governments involved? Are there parties to this conflict? Applicable legal provision of international humanitarian law, which rules, written or customary, it's very important to know, are applicable. The 1949 Geneva Conventions, all four or only one of them applies. The common Article 3, the 1949 Geneva Convention, or additional Protocol 1 or Protocol 2, 1977. So when you're in the field, all these things need to be inside you because you are part of a humanitarian and this humanitarian diplomacy. Applicable legal provision of universal regional human rights law, applicable legal provision of refugee law, applicable domestic legislation, which other standards could apply in local customs, code of conduct, ethics, or spiritual values. All these things we've been learning some of them. Are there mechanisms declaring which law is applicable on the national, regional, or universal? When you know this, your work is easy. You can work anywhere in the world. Are there mechanisms implementing international humanitarian law, human rights, refugee law on the ground or more remotely? So I want to stop there tonight because there is another class jumping in. But I want to stop there tonight unless somebody has a question or a contribution. Leaders, you're welcome. Anybody with a question or a contribution, please, you're welcome. Please, you're welcome. Please, you're welcome. You're welcome, leaders. Right, I want to stop there. Uh, I know the lecturer is waiting the other side.
Um, I, I want to stop up here because the lecture is waiting. And uh, I'll be happy uh, logging out so that members can log in. Uh, uh, many say they like using uh, the Zoom link. No, sorry. Um, you like using the Google Meet. Please, I want to encourage the class. Allow, there's a Google Meet shared in the class and uh, the instructor is waiting for us that side. Members, do you see the Google Meet the other side? Do you see it? Oh, I, I, I think I'm one of the, let me log out and to log in in the Google Meet because I thought we are in here. Yes, yes, we we were in the past class. All right. Yes, thank you, thank you. Can we all join Google Meet? Bless you and have a good evening. <laughs>